trading because I'm trying to record also these these talks and uh, you know whoever wants to to access them uh, can do so uh, afterwards that is if I find them in the archive okay what is going on here just a second because I'm a little bit overwhelmed by uh, uh, okay I guess you see the the, the you know the PDF uh, no, the, the PPT, the PowerPoint presentation page. So I'll begin with, uh, with Joseph Hoffman. And I do not see the list of the participants. In case you see Bruce Danzinger uh, showing up, please let me know and I'll stop my presentation. So this is one of the three students of uh, Otto Wagner I, I intend to present to you because he was a very important architect and in fact, he was considered the first star architect. And uh, Le Corbusier appreciated him very much. He even tried to work with him, but uh, from what I read, he didn't succeed. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, he's not so well known in some circles and maybe because he also had uh, some kind of an interest in, uh, you know, uh, or, on ornament in a certain way. We'll see. So you see the first star, star architect or star architect. Uh, well, I guess his mustache also helped for that status. Um, and this is the man, uh, the first star architect, Joseph Hoffman, uh, student of Otto Wagner. And uh, he built and he was also an excellent designer. And there are also some interesting stories about him that, um, you know, he liked to design everything. Um, there is that story, which I found in relation with him, but also with, uh, with uh, other people. So I don't know any longer if, he, if it is connected with him, but he designed a villa and he designed everything, even the sleepers of the client. And when he, one day visited uh, the client, saw that he had a different pair of slippers and uh, he became outraged. How in the world did the client uh, avoid the perfection of his uh, prescriptions? Some drawings, as you can see, his drawings are um, ornamental and playful. Uh, he was a, a very interesting architect and some admire him very much. And you can imagine if Le Corbusier, uh, who was not uh, the most gentle person on earth, uh, was seduced by uh, the idea of working for Joseph Hoffman, it means uh, he, he, he was popular and uh, he had qualities. Okay, so um, you see even the... I mean, the drawings are, are, are playful and, uh, you know, uh, almost irresponsibly so. So I, I do not suggest to you to follow this path in your uh, dealings with the school because you might uh, infuriate certain professors. I don't know. Anyway, I mean, you would say this is a drawing of a child, of, a, of an infant almost. But he's one of the most important architects of the modern movement. This only shows because Otto Wagner drew beautifully and in a very, um, you know, uh, sophisticated and educated way. But it seems he was not dogmatic. So his students allow themselves um, degrees of freedom that, uh, you know, other professors might have a hard time to deal with. On the other hand, it would be unfair to describe him as some kind of... Uh, you know, a childish architect. No, he was not. In fact, he was quite sophisticated and, uh, and complex. But his drawings, yes, do even this drawing. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it looks as if it is almost naive. Uh, but again, when we arrive at the built work, you'll see that uh, he was not naive at all. Now, Villa Spitzer uh, from 1902, at uh, that time, his professor had about 40 years. No, no, he was older. At that time, uh, Otto Wagner was uh, 16 years um, before his, uh, his dying. So it was about 55 or so. Anyway, it's not a bad building. It's, uh, and, and this is an early work of Joseph Hoffman. 
uh, all these architects, uh, Jos Jose Plechnik also built in Vienna, although he was Slovenian. And Ljubljana is his city. In fact, if you want to see a lot of great architecture in Ljubljana, you go to, uh, you go to Ljubljana and you see a lot of buildings and an incredible bridge by Plechnik, which you are going to see soon. So he designed everything, you know, even uh, the wallpaper and uh, everything, rugs, everything, and sleepers of the client. He was a designer, born a designer, died a, a designer. Okay, well, of course, the, the, the building is still kind of traditional or traditional looking, but uh, it has qualities. Another one from 1902. Um, and there is, a, for those of you who came with me to Vienna, uh, maybe you didn't see, but there is a big villa, very luxurious, aristocratic, uh, at the edge of, of Vienna, not far away from Schönbrunn, built by him, and we'll arrive there. So, again, this is Joseph Hoffmann, the student of Otto Wagner. And these Austrians had so many and have so many great architects and, and, and artists, it's incredible. Already here you see a, a, a modernistic uh, interior, you know, and, and, and uh, I, I would say quite convincing. Now, as I said yesterday, for those of you who didn't attend yesterday, Otto Wagner was considered together with um, uh, Charles Mackintosh uh, in Scotland, and Louis Sullivan in the United States, one of the three forefathers of modernity in architecture. Not a, an inviolable position, no? So we are talking about Otto Wagner. There, it was a very interesting period in the history of uh, Austria, which was at that time the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, uh, because it was evolving towards modernity, but at the same time it was an empire. So there was an emperor there, uh, Franz Joseph. And uh, uh, this combination between, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the ideology and the aesthetics even and the cultural climate of an empire and uh, the aspirations quite legitimate uh, towards modernity created a very interesting context which was unique at that time in, 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 in this area, you know, in, uh, in Austria, Hungary, even parts of uh, uh, Romania. Uh, the rest of Europe was uh, free of, uh, of the emperor, so to speak. So the empire lasted for a few more years, but something interesting happened then. Okay, so we are still with uh, Joseph Hoffman. Um, the first star architect, even this building, you know, it's, it's almost modern in a way, you know, stripped of decorations, cubicle, uh, clean, so to speak. And the, even the interior, yes, there is some decoration, but it's based on a regular pattern. Um, yeah. Now, another house in Vienna, um, he built quite a lot, so obviously he was appreciated. And it did help, of course, to be the student of Otto Wagner. It was a, uh, you know, a, a great chance. Yesterday I showed the works of Red Vienna, where other students of, 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 of Otto Wagner built social housing, uh, social housing complexes um, quite, uh, quite imposing and uh, even, even necessary, of course, for that time. So this is interesting about Vienna, that it was a, a vortex of creative energies, very strong individualities, were very personal, almost idiosyncratic sometimes, but they also had often uh, left leanings so they were serving the aristocracy, but they also were concerned with, you know, social housing. Uh, and uh, I read that when the Red Vienna began to flourish, many intellectuals and artists um, gathered in Vienna because they were excited about this interesting meeting between um, 
you know, a monarchic city until 1918, a capitalist city, but also very open to, to some democratic concerns, even communist concerns, because that's what Red Vienna was and is about. It was an interesting um, uh, time in the history of this important European city. This is the building I visited with some students last year and previously. It's a large building by uh, Joseph uh, Hoffman, Villa Primavesi. As you can see, this is almost a palace. Uh, and it's very well done. It's a little bit difficult to see because of the bushes, uh, which are kind of tall. But um, you can see it from across the street, uh, from the sidewalk a little better, not as well as <laughs> this picture shows. Uh, it, it's an opulent villa, of course. Um, and it's on the way. Um, it's once you are at Schönbrunn and you continue your trip with a with a tram tram car or to with a, with a bus uh, or subway, even you'll arrive in the proximity of this building. But you have to know that it is there. Obviously, this is not a social housing. This is not for everybody, you know, but uh, what can you do? There are people of, uh, with privileges in this world and people less privileged. This is how life always was, I guess. Again, the, the presence of sculptures with maybe we will come one day back to some kind of uh, meeting, uh, renewed meeting between sculpture and architecture and fine arts in general, but hopefully not the way Michael, Michael Graves did it. This is a sanatorium uh, also in Vienna. And to my shame, I didn't see it. Uh, and it's probably not, not far away from where we, um, we, we were located um, at the House Erasmus. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't see it. It's uh, interesting also the interior, you know, who would think a sanatorium would look like this? You know, it's very welcoming, it's very warm, uh, and it looks like, a, you know, a private residence. And he's designed also the furniture and everything, as his habit was. Outside is, uh, you know, more austere. And this is one of the rooms, you know, uh, in a sanatorium it, it is not bad. So uh, they, they ate together that long table. And in fact, uh, the School of Architecture here in Bucharest, I propose something like this to, to put those beautiful, heavy, um, tables one, uh, you know, after the other, create a long table so all the students of an atelier to be able uh, to, to, to be together like a big family because I think it's a, it's a, it gives you a different feeling of belonging to a, to a studio, to an atelier, to a group. Yeah, he, he did a lot of uh, so-called object design, you know, design of industrial design, if you want to call it, you know, furniture design, and not only furniture. He, he was a dedicated um, designer. And as I said, he designed everything. <laughs> everything you see here is by him. Maybe even the plants, I am joking, but he designed everything. Yeah, this is the, well, it looks like an expensive resort hotel, not a sanatorium, you know. Uh, anyway. Now, this is a very famous work by him, and it is uh, present probably in all histories of modern architecture, uh, or most of them. Now, I think probably in, in, in all of them, in Brussels, it's, it's, it's notorious. It's maybe his masterpiece, if we are to use this word. So it's called the Palais Stockle, 1905-1911. Not bad.
he was lucky, you know, this was not destroyed like other buildings, you know, like, for example, the whole uh, Verbund exhibition in Köln from 1914, everything was, was, was demolished a few months after uh, the buildings were built, and there were great buildings, you know, by Gropius, by Van der Velte, by uh, Bruno Taut, incredible. And this was just a few, a few years earlier. I mean, nothing would be without interest for Joseph Hoffman, even a kitchen, you know, this is a kitchen, but he designed everything. Maybe even the forks and the knives and so on, the spoons. There is still a difference, of course, between the dining room uh, or the conference room and the kitchen, but uh, uh, you have the artworks by uh, Gustav Klimt, it looks like, no? Um, and I, I actually think Gustav Klimt died today. I mean, on the 14th of July. Um, if my memory is correct. I, I, I really find this period in Austria or Austro-Hungary uh, uh, or Hungary uh, extremely uh, uh, inciting and, and uh, even for our days, I, 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 there is a kind of art uh, and, and architecture that I think could be um, very inspiring for us as well. And I, I do believe, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe I'm not wrong, that it was this conjunction between uh, an empire which was, uh, you know, approaching its end and uh, the, the, the prospect of a certain modernity, which was very different from the empire. So you had the meeting between two ideological, socio-political systems, and something interesting happened then. And this is shown in that art, and the, in the architecture. Because in a way, you had both proletarians and uh, the aristocracy. For a short while, you had uh, some kind of a uh, mixture, uh, which was uh, uh, interesting. I mean, for me, visiting in Vienna the, the, the social uh, uh, housing uh, complexes uh, built uh, under the flag of Red Vienna was very liberating because you are in a very cultured and very cosmopolitan, aristocratic even city, which, which you saw that it, it was not ignoring uh, the less privileged. And there were uh, very ample uh, buildings built for them. Like for example, uh, the, uh, the Karl Marx Hof uh, is the longest um, social complex building in, in the world or housing, uh, social housing complex. One kilometer, if you add all the segments of uh, buildings that, um, you know, surround courtyards and so on. One kilometer, can you believe it? But we are still in Brussels, in Bruxelles, where uh, the, the avant-garde music uh, composer uh, Yanis Xenakis built an incredible pavilion for Le Corbusier, or should I say with Le Corbusier, and maybe you know it, hope, hopefully you know it, it was an unbelievable building. And Le Corbusier, at first, it is considered done by the office of Le Corbusier, and it was. But it seems the experts uh, know and think that the main uh, creative force was there was Yanis Xenakis, because Corbusier didn't work in that vein until uh, they produced this work, the, the two of them, Le Corbusier and Yanis Xenakis. But that building has been destroyed. Joseph Hoffman was lucky, his building was not destroyed. Now the Austria, Austrian pavilion for the Venice Biennial from 1934, look at it, you know, 1934, no? 86 years ago, he built a building which uh, using the standards of today is not, uh, is still, uh, is more than acceptable. It's, 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 it, it works, it still works. 
And uh, uh, so you see, an architect of vision is not conditioned fatally by um, the time he builds in. Now, this is the gravestone of a great uh, composer, Gustav Mahler. Uh, yeah, some architects at that time dedicated some time, including in the United States, Louis Sullivan designed several tombs or graves. This is not being done today, you know. It's like you never see, you know, uh, you never saw a, a grave or a tomb designed by Zaha or Chumi or Rem Kolkas or Frank Gehry. It is as if we, as if we are immortals and we devalued also death. So it's very interesting, not too long ago, I mean, less than 100 years ago, architects, some of the best architects, designed uh, important uh, pieces of architecture for the afterlife. That is a grave, a tomb, and so on. Not today, nobody talks about it. And I, I think this is a big problem, because if you devalue death, you also devalue life because they are uh, correlative, life and death. Of course, there is plenty of death on TV. You turn on the TV, it's impossible not to see crimes, death, blood, rapings, you name it. All the channels show them all the time. But paradoxically, maybe exactly because there is this excessiveness about uh, 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 representing uh, the scandalous side of life, of, of death, uh, death became devalued and uh, to the point of uh, frivolousness. And this is a great loss, I think. His own grave, he designed his own grave too. And this, well, could I say it's not bad? It doesn't sound right, you know, to say about a gravestone that is, is not bad. But it's not bad in terms of aesthetics, you know, it's, um, it's vertical. Of course, Moshe Safdi maybe would put above it something horizontal. But, um, and it's unusual, uh, strangely, although this is almost the, the first idea one should have about a gravestone, it's, it's, it's very simple and primordial and uh, archaic and, uh, um, you know, uh, it's almost archetypal in a way, but I never saw one like this except his, Joseph Hoffman. Not bad. Well, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Joseph, about this. He designed even the grave of Gustav Klimt, Klimt very differently. Um, now, if you turn that uh, plaque, uh, the, you know, plaque, plaque uh, horizontally, you almost get uh, the grave of Miss van der Rohe, except that Miss van der Rohe didn't wrote with us, uh, the, those big uh, letters and not with that font. Design. Well, <laughs> they designed everything, you know. Which one do you prefer? You know, there are two kinds of, uh, you know, knives, uh, two kinds of forks, uh, four kinds of uh, spoons and so on, unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> I can do, in fact, with a, with a spoon or with a fork, I, did, I eat everything, you know. I, I could even eat a soup with a fork. But I'm not an, a good example of uh, domesticity at all. You know. That's why I'm alone, of course. All right. So uh, still a uh, designer, uh, the first star architect uh, as a designer, a chair. He designed several chairs, you know, it seems, you know, uh, comfortable and solid and, and so on. Another chair from Joseph Hoffman. And another one, I have this suggestion for you as architects and students, if you didn't do it yet, try to design a chair. It's very rewarding and even uh, therapeutical. I know it was so for me and I designed several. I call them cere ceremonial chairs and I, I could show them to you one day. It's really an excellent exercise and uh, Miss van der Rohe I think was right when he said Sometimes, at least, it's easier to design a skyscraper than a, than a chair. And I believe it's true. It's not a, a, an easy exercise to, to, to do a good chair, no. But, as you can see, <laughs> he
he show, he he used his talent to to design everything. This is almost his uh, gravestone. I'm joking a little bit. Uh, we saw this another chair that maybe Le Corbusier might have loved. He loved the square, of course, as you can see. Um, they are voluptuous. They are. This is a voluptuous, uh, cubistic uh, form of aesthetics, if I can uh, express myself almost oxymoronically. You know, the voluptuousness of the cube. The cube was never considered as a voluptuous uh, geometrical figure, but uh, but here maybe there is a certain um, you know voluptuousness. I mean, you know, it does look very comfortable. Okay, uh, another chair, more sinuous, uh, a brochure. <laughs> this is in Romanian, it's a jewel actually. And I think this is the last image of, um, of uh, Joseph Hoffman. Okay, so we go, but I still have to say, we are dealing also with a member of the secessionist movement. That very movement that had a beautiful, beautiful um, um, logo or, or credo or I don't know how to call it to each time it's art and to art it's freedom and I really think this is as valid today as it was then and I think we should remember that this that we have to fight for the freedom of our art and for our art to be um, uh, you know uh, expressing our time and not some other time okay now if you allow me, I'll go to Olbrich, the other brilliant student of, uh, of um, Otto Wagner, who also designed the secessionist building. And uh, what, a, what a period in the history of art and architecture, really, they, they were incredible. So he died young at uh, 40, 41. Joseph, again, Joseph Maria Olbrich. Uh, <laughs> Yes, he, he looked triumphalist here because, uh, you know, he was young and optimistic and everything worked for him. I mean, he, did, he designed the secessionist move, uh, uh, building when he was very young and he was very talented. And he had a chance to have a professor like Otto Wagner and he was living and working in Vienna. What more could you ask for? Um, and you can see he was protecting his uh, costume, uh, his vest and his trousers with, um, <laughs> you know, with something while he was working. Of course, he was, uh, you know, a careful man. And uh, he spent some time probably in the mirror uh, taking care of his mustache. <laughs> drawings, drawings, yes, many drawings uh, of these, uh, talented uh, Austrians. Well, this is a little bit too sweet for our taste today, but, um, you know, we are at a different time in, uh, in the evolution, let's call it so, of, of architectonic culture. Um, this is the side elevation of the secessionist uh, building that he built. I wonder how these people got the funds to build this building because, you know, the secessionists, I mean, secession means breaking away, kind of like the rebels. But the rebels were doing well. I mean, they, they built in the center of Vienna an uh, imposant building. And, uh, yeah, uh, they were able to do certain things. But there was a certain nostalgia for the past. And again, you can see the, the, the still the empire was, uh, was, was present in sometimes pleasing forms like the, you know, the, the floral parts of, of, of vegetation, of trees, of, uh, they, they, and the aesthetics show this. And yes, they were part also of the, influenced at least of, by Jugendstil, and they were part of that movement as well. Secession. I like this word. I think we need a secessionist movement right now, right here. Uh, I would gladly sustain it, but I don't know how to generate the funds to build a building like, like they did. Um, yeah, he designed also like Joseph Hoffman, uh, you know, objects. Now the secession building, which is impossible to miss if you visit Vienna. 
1898. Here it is. And what you see on the left side of the elevation written Versacrum, Versacrum was the magazine that they published. Beautiful. I really think that, 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 that uh, uh, you know, a magazine could, could bring people together. And in our case, it could be even online. But there was a certain idealism. These people believed in, in what they were doing. They were against commercialism. They wanted to separate themselves from uh, the mercantile uh, form of art and architecture. And they were successful. And this was an excellent uh, magazine, Versacrum. And on top, above the entrance, is uh, written in German that um, uh, what I translated in this way, to each uh, time it's art and to art it's freedom. Here, der Zeit uh, ichre Kunst, der Kunst ichre Freiheit. Not bad. And I really think these words, these thoughts, these feelings are as relevant for us today as they were for them. But we have to remember them and whisper them uh, and uh, maybe even uh, externalize them more than just whispers. And that golden uh, sphere made of leaves symbolically is also beautiful because it's about unity, it's about idealism, and uh, 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 the coming together of the creative forces, uh, I think, very, very uplifting for all of us, but also for society at large, at least in the long run. One day, uh, two years ago, I was laying on the grass uh, on the other side of this building. And uh, after a while, a policeman came to me, very polite, and he asked me if I feel well. I said, yes, sir, I feel well. And he was happy. He lowered his head and said, OK, thank you. Bye. Very civilized, you know. So you could lay there on the, on, on, on the grass, you know, as if it is your own courtyard. And we are talking about the very center of Vienna, not some, uh, you know, uh, forgotten place at the periphery. Okay, this is the plan. The Rai exhibition, actually, the, uh, the organization is still uh, on, so to speak. But I don't think they have that, that, that force that they had, um, you know, more than 100 years ago. And you see, you have the combination between the plan of the building and graphic work of some symbolic or, or uh, metaphoric, uh, uh, you know, leanings at least, and uh, and then and 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 and, and the letters, and the, so that there is a, a richness here that often we don't have because our arts are disintegrated. We we do not think about bringing together graphic art illustration, painting, sculpture, and architecture together. And I think it's a great loss for us. Also, of course, the deterioration of, of, of the idea that ornamentics are valuable to architecture. I mean, this building, if you eliminate the ornaments, you eliminate an important part of the building. In some schools of architecture, even the word is banished, is not used as if it is indeed a crime. But I'm actually intending to write an essay polemical towards Adolf Loos, whom I admire, called Structure and Crime, because I think an excessiveness uh, of affection uh, uh, towards uh, structure, uh, if not obsession, is, is dangerous. You need a balance. Because you see these, these ornaments, what are they actually? Well, they represent uh, what, uh, what a tree has in the spring when, when it springs to life, when the flowers show up and the leaves green and so on. So it's the flowering of the building. And, and we don't even think of, of flowering buildings. And I think it's a great loss because that's why many of so, our so-called modern buildings are actually uh, dry trees, if they are trees at all. 
but but ornament is coming back with uh, with great um, uh, force actually a persuasive force do not such things bring richness to the building i think they do and plus there is a narration here sometimes uh, you know involved with or inspired by uh, mythology that we lost also anyway another house uh by, i mean uh, <laughs> i'm not talking about joseph hoffman i'm talking about ulbrich um, this is a um, uh, you know a smaller house if you compare it with the secessionist uh, but he died young so uh, i'm surprised that besides the secessionist building he also built this and uh, this one is also kind of interesting and look at the uh, funambulesque almost our uh, 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 you know uh, exotic uh, narration on the facade you know who think today to do something like this but my question is why not is it too naive or too picturesque or, or what I don't think Olbrich was a naive man and uh, Vienna was not a naive city then look, the, the, these details bring joy, actually, you know, to, to the building. And talking about the flowering tree, I mean, here is more than flowering. We are talking about fruits already. So the connection between architecture and nature could be symbolized and expressed in various ways, uh, even in, in this figurative uh, way. Another house from 1901, kind of interesting, a little bit uh, eclectic, but uh, interesting. And you see the entrance into the house. It is an event, as we saw in the case of Otto Wagner. The entrance into a building was not just a hole in the wall. It had character. It meant that threshold between the inside and the outside. And uh, yeah, the entrance into a building sh should mean something. Although, uh, maybe you know, Aldo, uh, not Aldo, uh, sorry, Alvaro Siza said that the most important uh, architectonic part is actually the window. And he was uh, referring to Frank Lloyd Wright, who said that, well, architecture wouldn't be difficult to do if there were no windows to, to handle. And from here, Siza derived the, the thought that yeah, the window is the most important. I think that not just the window, the door as well, except that the door usually, I mean, we have many more windows as compared to, to the door. But you do, in order to enter the building, you cannot enter through the window, you enter through the door. So that door should, should, have, should be treated in a certain way. And maybe, yes, there are a few more doors, you know, like a service door. It depends on the scale of the building. So the door is important as well. But it's true, the window is the one you look through from the inside towards the outside. In the case of Wagner also, the, uh, the entrance had a special design, the entrance into the building, uh, the door, uh, and uh, there was, like in this case, some graphic work above or an artwork and Wagner, as if you remember, those who were present here yesterday, uh, had above the door even, uh, you know, some kind of symbolic uh, artwork for his own house. Another house by uh, Olbrich. Um, and even here, you see the entrance is an entrance into a building that refuses to have any kind of entrance. It's a special entrance. Uh, yeah, the, the building, the facade also has a special uh, configuration, aesthetical configuration, but uh, uh, the first contact with the building, besides looking at it from afar, is the entrance door. Okay, another Vienna, another Vienna, another villa, sorry, in Vienna. Um, Uh, please remember that time uh, Vienna was still uh, the, the, the capital of the empire, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 
House Olbrich in Darmstadt. Uh, here there was a whole complex of buildings for artists. It was like a colony for artists in Darmstadt and he designed several buildings. An interesting uh, social experiment in a way to, to build for, for a community of artists. This is also in Darmstadt. Uh, uh, you'll see uh, a little later on, but you see these architects because architects are usually good at not just designing buildings, but designing posters, textiles, you name it. Uh, this is an interesting work and quite large and complex and uh, I would say convincing. Maybe less convincing this, uh, you know, pavilion here a little bit, um, you know, to, I don't know, a little bit uh, was modernistic, if I can say so, but look at the tower and so on. It's it's not bad for a young architect to also build the other building. is is, is not bad at all, and the tower is uh, uh, is towering indeed. Bravo to Maria Olbrich. And here is the you know the you know some social uh, gathering. And here is a Russian Orthodox Church in the proximity of the, that complex of buildings by uh, Olbrich. Uh, it's interesting also what's going on here in the foreground. This is why it's so important to know well the history of architecture, not for the sake of history, but for the sake for the, of the present, actually, in effect, for the sake of the future, because I believe a significant so-called history is the one that doesn't pass. So this is not the past. It's a, it's a continuous present. And yes, there are specificities related to the time when these uh, buildings in this case were built, but there is also a continuum. So if you attend um, with care uh, the, the, the evolution of, uh, of, of, of cultural history, you realize that you are on the spiral of time together with many other artists, architects, thinkers, and so on. So you feel less alone, you feel inspired. So again, I'm actually against history. I, I, I am rather uh, interested and uh, preoccupied by a history or an history, by that part of history which doesn't pass, that part of the past, so-called past, which doesn't pass which is in a way eternal, because I do believe in what uh, Charles Baudelaire, the great French poet said, and he was a very astute art critic. And I truly recommend you his writings on art. This poet, brilliant poet, was also a brilliant critic in the 19th century. And he said, art has two halves. One half is connected with the, with the ephemeral, the circumstantial, the transitory. And the other half is with the eternal, the immutable, with what is permanent. And I do believe indeed art has two halves. One connects with your time and place, but there is another half which connects to what, you know, in the absence of a better word, could be described as, you know, the eternal, the, the unmovable, or the, 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 the unchanging, the, the, the permanent. And this is why we are moved by art that was made centuries ago, because it has a side which is still relevant, as opposed to science. Science is not like this. Anyway, um, I still think, again, that sculptures add something to, 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 to buildings, but again, not the way uh, Michael Graves used them for his Walt Disney uh, melodramas. Good work, Olbrich, and the tree seems to be happy too. The tree, some furniture by him, because just like Joseph Hoffman, he designed furniture as well. Um, at that time, it would have been inconceivable that an architect doesn't also do interior design or object design. They are all the same, they, they all belong to, to, to architecture, to design, the separation uh, between them is not a good thing. I would say even more. Architects are usually very interested and interesting uh, urbanists. 
And we know there are cases, some may, they may mistake sometimes, like Le Corbusier with uh, Bill Radieuse, uh, or maybe even Wright with his Broadacre City, but they all had interests, and even Palladio. Palladio said it clearly. A room is like a house, the house is like a street, the street is like a, um, the, the city, and vice versa. In other words, a, a true architect is animated by the same creative forces to design from the smaller thing to the largest, from a spoon and the fork and so on, to a city. The, 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 the compositional uh, elements of his work are about the same in essence. That's why here you have an architect designed furniture and we saw one before doing the same thing and they could have designed cities just as Otto Wagner did. In fact, the activity of Otto Wagner as an urbanist was extremely rich. We didn't talk yesterday about it, and uh, but maybe one day we will. Interesting, interesting uh, chairs, you know, and not just chairs. Of course, they had good craftsmen. Vienna had then good craftsmen, and it still does. You can see, if you go to Vienna, you see in the city, here and there, small shops, you know, woodworking or, uh, you know, uh, I, I appreciate this very much, a sophisticated contemporary city, which still has an interest in crafts, small shops, and, and so on. Uh, this is, I think, great. Quite prolific, no? For an architect would be so much. He designed jewels as well, of course. I showed some of the works done in, in the field of fashion and architecture a few days ago. You know, so my suggestion to the schools of architecture is to open up their mentality and have the architect also de design jewels, have the jeweler design buildings, have the urbanist design interior design and make, in other words, create some kind of mingling between, the, be, between these um, uh, otherwise separated uh, fields and they shouldn't be separated really. I actually, I would be very interested to see a hotel or a building, a school designed by a industrial designer or to see a chair or a rug uh, designed by an architect and so on. Just as these people did. Okay, and now the last one will be a very, very interesting architect uh, who also built in Vienna, uh, maybe more than, I only know two important buildings by him in Vienna, by Plechnik, uh, but I think he has also another one or two houses. Um, he was quite a quite a good architect, and uh, Ljubljana, Ljubljana is like uh, Vicenza, Palladio's Vicenza, uh, Plechnik's Ljubljana. He lived a long life, and uh, here was one day, uh, some days ago, the dean of the School of Architecture in Timisoara, Ioan Andrescu, who who who, who told us that um, he he was kind of a mystic, maybe. Anyway. This is the man. He does look a little bit like a mystic. I am partially uh, joking a little bit, but he was an intense man, an interesting man, and I have seen two buildings by him in Vienna. Uh, the first church in uh, um, concrete ever built, modern church, and a large office building with a huge uh, uh, archangel uh, hanging on the facade very, very interesting and very, very unusual. This is the man. Uh, uh, he was without doubt a mystic considering his adoration of the, of the, of the dog. Uh, I'm joking again. He, he looks like an interesting man. Let's, let's confess it. And even this picture is beautiful because he's all dressed in black and has a cane and he holds a white, um, what is it, a pay pigeon? Uh, uh, yeah, a very interesting man. And uh, maybe uh, Ljubljana is on the list with the, with the best 100 architecture schools in Europe. 
partly because of him. I, I imagine. A proud man, but this proud man uh, studied with Otto Wagner and he built in Vienna. Uh, this, this is the villa that I didn't see and I should have seen and we should have seen it when we were there with a number of students. So it is in Vienna. It has an interesting, uh, uh, you know, the facade because of the way he treated the, uh, the elevation. Uh, it's not uh, such a small building and it only shows that Vienna was in a way fair, you know, if, if an architect had talent and seriousness and he was hard working, he was commissioned right there in Vienna. He, in fact, he was commissioned before he was commissioned in, in, in the city he came from. I, I truly have admiration for a society which appreciates and supports and encourages and sustains its artists and its architects and its writers and its poets. Because what would the city do without them? Another villa, uh, this one also I didn't see to my shame. Anyway, um, maybe we'll go one day, maybe next year. If the pandemic ends, I invite everybody here to go to Vienna. We have great uh, uh, lodgings at House Erasmus, very inexpensive, right in the center of Vienna. And uh, Vienna is a city to explore, no doubt. Another villa, God, I didn't, uh, I didn't look at this presentation for some time. Yes, there is the Noodle King, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the paraphernalia of consumerism uh, that we cannot get rid of. But I guess uh, that soup probably is not bad. I like noodles. I didn't eat a noodle soup in a long time. Uh, by the way of noodles, there is a Japanese film, very interesting, I think it's called Noodle Soup, where a group of businessmen, Japanese, enter a noodle soup restaurant, and or, uh, they enter a restaurant, and uh, it was actually a more sophisticated restaurant, uh, but the movie is called, I think, Noodle Soup, and uh, the, the waiter comes to them and tells them, they were celebrating something, what kind of champagne they want, and none knew about champagnes anything. The, 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 the boss, the big man, was actually short. Didn't know anything because those people fought hard, worked hard to build Jap Japan after the war. The only one who knew about champagne was the man who was making Xerox copies. He was, uh, was actually tall and uh, young, and he knew because he didn't have to struggle to you know, uh, develop Japan uh, after the war. So what a change, no? Those who work hard to make Japan into a superpower knew nothing about champagne, while uh, their grandson or the, their son knew because, yes, time changed. Anyway, a digression, sorry, but even this building is interesting. Look at the top part. Uh, yeah, he was whimsical. Joseph Plechnik was a whimsical architect. I think in his case, the word whimsical is appropriate. Uh, God, you know, <laughs> I'm astonished. I knew he built something else be besides what I saw, but I didn't expect him to build so many uh, buildings. I prepared this presentation, I think two years ago, and since then I, I forgot how many buildings he built in Europe, in, uh, in Vienna. This is also kind of interesting, you know, uh, and, and, and more, uh, more playful actually than what uh, Otto Wagner, his professor did. Now, I can't wait to go back to Vienna and look at these pictures, uh, search for them on a bicycle, of course. To bike through Vienna is great. Now, this is the building I was telling you about. It is not far away from St. Stephen's Cathedral. Uh, it's very close, actually. And you can see the Archangel here hanging on the, on, on the facade. Uh, and uh, yes, look at the top of the building. It's very well done. It's, uh, it 
it's uh, you know it's an office building uh, but uh, <coughs> He, I, 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 the idea to, to hang, uh, you know, an archangel on the facade, the long facade, the main facade of the building is uh, almost outrageous, but uh, I think it's beautiful. Who would do something like this today? And it has to do with uh, um, uh, narration, because he was telling a story through that archangel. You know, I forgot exactly what it was. It, it, it related to bringing luck to the owner of the building. Do we think of such matters when we design today? No, we don't. And we don't tell stories through our buildings. No, not at all. And I think it's a great loss. Uh, the Zakir house, yes. Look at it. I mean, that so-called accident there is uh, is uh, you know in a way the the, the 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 essence of this project, but it's not just it. Of course, even if you remove it, is a brilliant building. But with it there, uh, the, the, there is more to the building than just uh, the glory of the building. So I, I think I think it's 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 one of the great buildings in Vienna, really. And as I said, it's just one block away from uh, St. Stephen's Cathedral. You can imagine how appreciated Joseph Plechnik was. Look at it. <laughs> yes, defending the client and the building from the malevolent forces, I guess, of uh, fate. Not bad. Bravo to them. We saw yesterday also beautiful, uh, uh, you know, uh, figurative art, but abstracted also for the Steinhof Church by Otto Wagner. Ah, what a what a period in 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 art history and in the history of architecture. Really, we 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 made modernism into something so dry, almost lifeless. We have to go back to some kind of joie de vivre, otherwise we die of, of boredom. But why would a wealthy industrialist in early 20th century Vienna install a monumental image of St. Michael on the facade of his house anyway? The answer is quite simple. According to the biblical tradition, it is the Archangel Michael who overcomes Satan and all evil spirits. He was therefore chosen by Zacher, the client, as a slightly far-fetched and somewhat blasphemous symbol of the product which had made the Zucker family rich. Well, why not? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, he, the company was producing some kind of insecticide guaranteed to overcome all evil bugs and midges. So this is the story. I forgot, but now I remember. I hope some kind of uh, Archangel Michael uh, uh, would, would fight off mosquitoes, which I hate. They don't let me sleep. I, I, I don't know why God created mosquitoes, you know. Maybe this insecticide works against, uh, against uh, mosquitoes as well. Okay, <laughs> here is an advertising. <laughs> yeah, I guess it should work. Ah, oh, I have to buy this from somewhere. Anyway, um, if they still produce it. You see how important narration is, even with a humoristic twist, it's important to invest again architecture with a complexity that we renounced fatally for, for too many years. Reinvest architecture with narration. Make a narrative architecture. I mean, I mentioned this and I will say it again. Paul Valéry in his little book, Eupalinos, Ul Architect, Eupalinos or, or, or the Architect, said clearly there are three kinds of builders. The one who puts a stone above another stone, that's a builder. But the second one who puts a, a stone above another stone and makes them talk, in other words, they narrate something, that's a master builder. And the third one, of course, is the one who makes them sing, the stones, and that's the architect. But this is for us, you know, emancipated human beings of the 21st century, something so old-fashioned and naive an idealistic, what do you mean to make the stone sing? Come on, you know, come to your senses, be realistic. 
I hate this realism which kills all aspiration, all lofty longings and so on. It's terrible. We have to go back to dreaming. And like uh, Joseph Plesnik was dreaming. Good for him that he was considered a mystic. Great, we need mystics in architecture again. Now this is the church we visited and in fact was not far away from our dorm. The first church in uh, concrete, in apparent concrete, uh, uh, um, modern, modern church. The church, the interior maybe is not so impressive, but um, uh, in the basement there is a different story. Unfortunately, it's very hard to find how to turn on the light, but we, we managed. This is not, in, it's not this one, sorry, that picture is in Ljubljana, but we'll arrive at that church. He built some uh, interesting things. This is the basement of this church that I mentioned, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting, a little bit ominous uh, space. That's how it looks when you turn on the lights and you don't have the benches, which uh, now do exist. But look at the columns, and he uses a very interesting kind of concrete where you see the, 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 the little stones. It's a conglomerate, conglomerate, but it has character and it's rich. Very interesting uh, uh, concrete. Now we go to Ljubljana, the Congress Square from 1928. So about that time Villa Savoie was built, right? Uh, this is just a park, but we'll arrive at, uh, uh, at, at, at some buildings. Now we'll show some, uh, some of his works in, in, in this uh, lucky city to have, uh, to have uh, Plechnik. A fountain. He also built, a, you will see, a very interesting bridge. Uh, and even the fountain, you know, it's, it's almost surreal. Uh, uh, I mean, something surreal about it, you know. It's, I don't know what it is because I have seen columns, I have seen the lions uh, spitting uh, water, but somehow together creates an almost surreal uh, stage design urban stage design. This is a very interesting and unique bridge because it has three, that's why it is called the triple bridge extension from 1931. Uh, look at it, he, I mean, the functionalist would say, come on, you are losing the money of the city for nothing. Why are you creating three bridges when one would, would have been enough? Well, you know, rational, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rational uh, justifications are not always uh, the most appropriate. You know, I mean, I don't know what reasons he had, but uh, I guess I can imagine certain reasons. You know, one, the one on the right was serving uh, the street on the right, the one on the left the other way, and the one in the center serving that square in the center. So, but it's a very interesting uh, bridge, no doubt. Not to speak about the fact that uh, you know the, the the street on the other side of the river is um, is um, modifying its uh, its uh, you know uh, geometry. So I'm sure Plechnik knew what he was doing, and, and the city built it. And bravo to him and to them. I mean, he was more inspired than Calatrava in Venice. This is without doubt. In fact, I would see, see this building in Venice as well. But the one that Santiago Calatrava built near Stazione uh, Santa Lucia uh, is a disaster. And no wonder <laughs> the Venetians uh, uh, almost screamed against it. Maybe some even lost their lives falling on that uh, demagogical glass on the on the so-called pavement of the of the bridge affectations of uh, contemporary architects you know how could you put glass and why of course it's uh, resistant now look in the plan you know it looks harmonious but also a little bit whimsical so if you want to see this bridge well, Ljubljana is not too far away and you might even see an interesting exhibition in architecture from a school which is on the list with the best schools in Europe. Okay, we move forward. Uh, you see the plan, very interesting solution, if I am to use the word solution. 
Yes, it was more expensive, but uh, you know, you cannot judge every architectural gesture in terms of the of, of cost. You know, sometimes it's necessary, but other times maybe not or less. And you can see all three sides are used. Well, a student uh, asked me a day or two before, you know, why, 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 why are architects uh, employed for designing bridges? Well, that's exactly why, because beauty is, is uh, welcomed in, in, in everything that is built and, and you know, by, by man. You, know. you can have uh, an architect designing a fence or a, you know, anything, you know, a church, a fence, a bridge. Okay, this is a, ch a church in Belgrade. Uh, quite interesting, you know. E even this church uh, is is modern, is resolute, is uh, is vigorous. Is uh, I, I like it. No, he was a complex architect and uh, quite courageous, mystic or not. Um, And he was not afraid to, of course, it's also about the time when he built, but it's the modernity of the volumes, but you also have historical uh, references, you know, like the framing of the windows and even the type of window he uses. And so there is this melange between uh, historicism in a way, but used discreetly and the vigor of, uh, of uh, assumed modernism. You are almost on the point of saying this is not a church. If you didn't see the cross and maybe a few other things. And exactly because of this ambiguity, uh, I think arch his architecture is very interesting. Church of the Most Sacred Heart in Prague, 1932. This is an important building by him. And as you can see, it's in good shape and uh, f uh you know ho happily didn't was not destroyed in the in the in the war uh even this one is uh you know uh, kind of unique and original uh, you know that that big clock there and uh, even this one is a little bit whimsical and look at you know some details not bad at all Interesting architect. Otto Wagner probably loved him. And the inside also is interesting, you know, so behind that clock, you have this uh, ramp. Um, So the Rosetta, the Rosetta of the Gothic Cathedral became here uh, actually clock, but it's also a kind of a window. So you have both the window, it's not a stained glass window of the Gothic cathedrals, but it's also a clock. Interesting idea and, and unconventional. The interior is impressive, let us confess. It is impressive. It is a white space, it's a modern space, it's a luminous space, but it has also the tectonics are convincing, then you have the, the sculptural ensemble that is also, uh, you know, uh, inspired. Not bad. It's almost like you say, it's almost like the, the uh, you know, uh, the space of a big factory that became a church. And, you know, the space itself is, you know, it's not spectacular. It's a single large space with windows at the top. But because of the treatment of the ceiling and, uh, you know, some narrative uh, details and the benches, it became, and I like this fact, you know, I could almost call it an uh, uh, industrial church or, uh, 
yeah, which is warmed up by the presence of the golden objects, the, the sacred uh, narrative objects scattered through 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 the building. Interesting. Then uh, this uh, house also is uh, very intriguing in in in. Uh, in Ljubljana, it makes me think a little bit of the flat iron building in New York City. It's not so tall, plus it has some historical references, but it's well designed, really, and uh, I wouldn't mind at all to have my studio there at the top. The noise probably would be uh, bearable if there is traffic, but it's also Palladian in a way, the building, and it's, yeah, again, it is modern and it is whimsical, and it is historicist. And you see the plan at the bottom. Not bad. Bravo to Plechnik. Now, his own house in Ljubljana, uh, a small house, which has the same characteristics it is uh, it is half modern, half historicist, half serious, half whimsical. You don't know exactly how to decide, how to describe, but I think some of the best art and architecture is just like that, kind of ambiguous, uh, in between. And it can even be romantic, and I think even as a ruin, it, uh, it was probably, uh, or it could be, or is, I don't know what its state is now, but could be inspiring. Um, it, he didn't build a palace for himself. It, it was probably just him and the dog, the mystic and the dog. But uh, it's it, it's a nice it's a nice little house. And here it is, the scene of the crime. The you know the, the the architect and his uh, his table his desk nice moving uh, you know you almost expect him to open a door and say hello to us and uh, invite us to look at his drawings Church of St. Michael. This is an, uh, another interesting and almost peculiar church. Uh, look at this. Really, he, he, he was an astonishingly original architect. You know, uh, I mean, how many churches of this kind are there in the world? There is a strange meeting between uh, sophisticated and gentle historicism and a certain roughness or rawness. It's raw, but it's also because of the historicist uh, details, it escapes uh, being uh, rough uh, or ungentle. And the inside, of course, the presence of wood uh, works up everything. And even here, I mean, he's close to be or being, uh, I mean, he, there is a danger here. If you don't have the skill of Plechnik, you could uh, approach uh, dangerously, uh, you know, the area of, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, some, some, some kind of kitsch, but he is not. He is avoiding that, that uh, infamous uh, area of art and architecture because of his skill, his ability to, to, to unite the opposites. And he's in a dangerous terrain here, you know. Uh, Antoni Gaudi, in, in a way, uh, played this safer. But here you have this collage of various uh, cultural and architectonic elements, which uh, that's why I said he was in a dangerous terrain. But I think he, 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 he handled them very well. I mean, who would he expect, you know, you have this interior and then this exterior. 
uh, not to speak about this perpendicular entrance into the building, uh, which is uh, unusual, and surrounded by uh, these columns which support nothing. But uh, I don't know. I, I think it's very interesting. And very experimental. This was an experimental architect. He didn't repeat himself. And look at that stair there. You, you, you almost do not see the, the, the parapet, you know. I wonder, does it have a parapet? Uh, I hope he does. <laughs> As opposed to that building in Ahmedabad by Le Corbusier, which put, he put the parapet near the wall and not on the other side, if you can believe it. No wonder he was afraid he might fall in a amusing uh, picture with him. Unfortunately, it was Doshi behind him to catch him in case the, the irresponsible monster, most, I said almost monster, master uh, would have fallen. So, uh, ah, I have to change my, why did I, and it's not because I wanted to be whimsical, that bizarre, please forgive, uh, forgive me, I, I had to remove that, I have to change that picture with so-called myself, of course it's not myself, I wish I, it was myself, but it's not myself in that picture. I was playing with it and I forgot it's still there, because the, the, the fatality of Zoom is that I cannot rehearse, I, I change the picture, but I cannot see how it looks like. And, uh, and so you see it and I didn't see it. And uh, that's the end of it. It's, uh, it's a disgrace. I feel disgraced. Now here is a tomb that is kind of similar no, to the one that Joseph Hoffman, Hoffman designed for himself. And I wonder actually who did it first. I have to double check this. Also a column, probably the height of a human being kind of. The Church of Mary of Lourdes in Zagreb, 1934. Lourdes it is indeed. I mean, it's heavy, it's dark, it's, um, uh, it's Lourdes. Then uh, Pavilion, this is also very interesting. I, I really think Plechnik uh, had some, some kind of genius. You know, the way he combines sweetness with roughness, you know, I mean, look at the window, it is sweet. And then you look at the columns and they are, you know, they are not really sweet, you know, because they are raw, they are rough. Very interesting. Even this one, right? It's rustic, it's robust, it's rustic, but it also has some kind of, uh, you know, a little bit of sweetness, but he escapes, he escapes the, the, the dangerous uh, side of sweetness because he, he combines it with, uh, with uh, vigor and even primal vigor. And also with slight touches of historicism. Now, the National and University Library of Slovenia, which is also an incredible building. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a large building. Uh, it's a public building. It has here also some historicist elements but it also has an unusual, unusual facade. The interior is also excellent uh, and uh, everything works. And look at the facade. I mean, you know, this is an adventurous facade. Look at the windows and look at those, the presence of the stones scattered like that, you know, uh, by, a, by a mad god on the, the otherwise flat facade. So he knew how to uh, bring life to the building because the building itself is very geometrical and regular. Now, uh, Plechnik was one of a kind, no doubt. And then there's just that column there, you know, which in a way tells you, uh, the, I am the symbol. I am the symbol of the verticality of culture. I represent the aspiration of man towards knowledge. That's it, the end of the story. Inside there are columns, but not like that one. That one is a rhetorical column there with a, with a message to be seen by the whole city and visitors.
look at it. And then you have some strange, uh, I don't know, uh, animals, minotaurs, what are they, you know? Uh, <laughs> yes, you see the value of narration, the value of mythology, the, 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 the value of symbolism. They are very important for architecture and for culture in general. And we devoided our culture, unfortunately, of, 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 of them. Maybe they will come back, hopefully, to life. And even in terms of details, and I saw this also in that church in, uh, in concrete, uh, the first modern church in concrete in, uh, in Vienna. You know, just the handle of a door. But look how it is. It is an event. And it should be an event. Because when you manipulate it, when you use it, a door opens. So you are in a special moment when you step between one space and the other. We don't think about handles any longer. We just pick them up already made by other people or industries and so on. But a handle is important. The only architect that I know of who does today or had concern about such so-called details was and is Stephen Hall. interesting library a little busy the facade but still uh, idiosyncratic and interesting almost a little bit crazy you know uh, uh, this puzzle on, on the facade with the stones and look at the plan it's clear it's uh, functional it's convincing okay now we have a gate in ljubljana uh, again, some kind of a bridge, just as Otto Wagner designed in uh, Vienna. Uh, he obviously knew the history of architecture, but he was also playful and uh, irreverentially he played at times with, uh, with, with history. Third courtyard and obelisk. Unbelievable, no? I mean, uh, well, he didn't build a cathedral, but uh, this obelisk itself is, is uh, uh, Quite a, quite a piece of work, you know, uh, very simple, but uh, not simplistic, and uh, it has sophistication. Yes, maybe he was indeed some kind of a mystic, but I think any great architect has to have a little bit, just a touch of, uh, of mysticism, if I can say so. I know it sounds terrible. What do you mean a touch of mysticism? I mean, a, a little spiritual concern, uh, 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 you know, some, some uh, spiritual longing. It's surreal, you know, it's uh, uh, the Eagle Fountain in the Prague Castle. I mean, look at this fountain. <laughs> it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Uh, right there, you know, on the top of the column, this, that golden sphere. Uh, Prague again, the entrance into this building, you see, even if it's, it looks like a, you know, service entrance or whatever, but it becomes an event. Why? Because he treated it as such. It's not just a hole in a wall. And this building, unfortunately, would have been one of the, maybe the eighth wonder of the world, or certainly of Europe, if it was realized, but it was not but maybe one day it will. Uh, this is the plan. So this, this was to be the parliament of, of, uh, of the country. And uh, look, at the, look, at the, look at this section. Look at those columns, so-called historical, but sloping, inclined, and supporting this tall, uh, narrow uh, pyramid or cone. Uh, very interesting. Too bad it was not built. It would have been the talk of the town, if not the world, no doubt.
everybody would have gone there to see it. The Cathedral of Freedom, so uh, it, it became in the project, the Cathedral of Freedom it was never built. The base would be classical columns, colonnades surrounding the two-story main part, topped by a huge conical dome rising 120 meters in the air. The dome would be supported by oblique columns. <laughs> that can only be uh, Plechnik. And here he, he was, you know, uh, some kind of an homage to him, you know. With this project, I hope they will build it one day. Then a cemetery in Ljubljana. This is also kind of big and, and complex. Uh, there are all kinds of um, houses for, for, for the disease, if I can call them houses. Look at, the, look at the lighting, you know. I mean, it almost tells you life is melting down one day, just as these lamps are melting down. And indeed, life is limited. One day will go down. And uh, you can take some interesting pictures. The play of light and shadow seems very inspiring. Okay. Uh, what else do I have here? Nothing. That's it. So uh, thank you. I thank you for your presence in uh, one hour and a half. We, we uh, traveled through the work of three remarkable architects and I hope you don't regret that you attended. I'll uh, just uh, yeah, stop the share. And uh, <laughs> I don't believe it. There are still uh, 14 people here. I mean, 13 besides me. I, I, I feel honored. You know. Um, okay. So what is?